uh, received a couple of flyers. The first one is, this is a, um, a special time of the year when we uh, commemorate the Holocaust. Um, you have a flyer. The local commemoration is on uh, Sunday the 23rd at uh, the Friedman Center. And it is sponsored by, um, let's see. Jewish Community Agency. The Jewish Community Agency. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, the second invitation is to uh, a new documentary on the Nazi betrayal of the rule of law. It's about the Nuremberg trials. And it'll be presented by uh, Dean Lawrence Rafel of the Turo Law Center. Um, and that is at Congregation Beth Ami in Santa Rosa. We hope that uh, some of you might be around um, towards the end of spring break to be able to attend those things. Um, I'm going to let the uh, Human Rights Club, after our lecture, give you some information on some of the events that are left. But I do want to mention one, and that is um, on April 30th, we have uh, one of the organizers, organizers of the West Coast Day of Conscience. Tim, do you want to stand up and just say a thing or two about what's going to happen on the 30th of April? Well, if you go to archives.org, archives.org, there's all the information about going on, on April 30th. We're going to stand hand in hand across the Golden Gate Bridge and um, have a vigil for Parker, and then there'll be a rally at Chris and Hill. It's just a little walk on the path um, afterward, and there'll be Jerry Powell will speak and music and dance and so forth. But you can get all the information at ourplex.org. Like the letter for like uh, our old our uh, our um, I would also like to point out that um, there'll be a showing of Darfur Diaries on the 28th, um, or the 26th, I'm sorry. Uh, did everybody get one of these? Okay, I think this is sponsored by SP. Those are uh, your dollars being sponsored. Um, and it's also in conjunction with the Human Rights Club. They're going to talk some more about what they um, have done after uh, Jerry Fowler speaks. So, after all of that information for you about various things, um, it's time for me to introduce Jerry Fowler to you. He is the director of the Committee on Conscience at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He has been a generous contributor to this series. Um, I think this is the fourth year. Um, he says he always loves to come to California because of the sunshine. <laughs> we kind of arrange for him to come during spring break, his children's spring break, so that the family could come. And um, yeah, so if any of you, if you, any of you have any interesting indoor activities that might appeal to younger children, you might come up to Jerry after he speaks. Um, but enough levity aside. Um, Jerry is a human rights lawyer. Um, he has done an incredible job in raising awareness about genocide in Africa and will have a great deal of uh, information for you. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Jerry. Uh, thank you, uh, Myrna, and thanks for inviting me um, to be here again. Can everyone hear me? Is this? Um, uh, but I have to tell you, I have two little girls. They're four and seven, and they were brought their swimsuits, and they were so excited. <laughs> well, they can uh, go swimming. Yeah. Oh, do you have an indoor pool here? Because uh, uh, we're staying tonight over at the DoubleTree, and uh, uh, it's got a very nice pool that's outdoors. <laughs> we had to explain to them, why do, why do hotels in California not have indoor pools? It's because usually you can swim outside. But um, anyway, they'll get over it. So I think one of those important life lessons that you have to uh, learn sometime. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, Darfur and about the continuing genocide emergency there 
I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm going to tell you a lot of things. Um, but, but my bottom line is this, and I'm just going to cut to the chase. It is that uh, our government is now starting to pay attention to Darfur in a way that they have not until now. Um, they, the U.S. government declared that what was happening in Darfur was genocide in September of 2004. It's more than 18 months ago. Um, and in that 18 months, more and more citizens, including and especially uh, students, um, have been raising their voices. And I do just want to uh, uh, acknowledge Tim's work and a colleague who's with him, Martina Nee from uh, San Francisco. Uh, they have been two tireless advocates on behalf of Darfur. And those voices are starting to be heard in Washington. And uh, what, what I've started to tell people is that uh, six weeks ago, the president started speaking about Darfur publicly, really for the first time. And he's spoken about it several times since then. And what I take from that is that the door to the White House has swung open, and we as citizens have to surge through it. Now is the time for us to raise our voices even louder. And uh, I'm just so thrilled to see all of the things that the Human Rights Club is doing here. And uh, this is a very intense month, April, um, leading up to April 30th, when there is going to be a rally on the National Mall in Washington. And as Myrna said, and as Tim and Martina are deeply enmeshed in organizing, there's going to be a companion rally here uh, in Northern California, uh, a vigil on the Golden Gate Bridge, and then a rally at Chrissy Field. And that is the time for all of us across the nation to make our voices heard. And um, uh, you will look back on this five years from now, ten years from now, uh, and you will be able to say that you took a stand when genocide was happening. And this is a tremendous opportunity. And we've gotten to this point because of the work of so many people, but we can't let up now. That is my bottom line message. We can't let up now. And uh, April 30th is going to be a very, very special day across the country. What I wanted to do, though, is to give you some more background, some more sense of what is happening in Darfur. Why is it that so many citizens have been standing up and speaking out? Why is it that the Human Rights Club has, has uh, put so much energy into this? And I'm going to show you some uh, photographs that I took uh, I've been to the region twice. Uh, I'll show you a map in just a minute. I haven't been into Darfur itself, but I've been to the uh, neighboring country of Chad and gone to the Sudanese border and met refugees and heard their stories. And I want to share some of those stories uh, with you today. Um, and then I'm also going to have some pictures that were taken by a friend of mine, uh, a man named Brian Steidel, who is a young American who was in Darfur for six months with this small African Union monitoring force that uh, is about the only protection that civilians in Darfur have. And he brought back uh, pictures of what he saw. And he, he was witnessing this genocide, and he just couldn't take it anymore because his mission was just to witness and to take pictures and to file reports that ended up someplace in Ethiopia. And so he left that, and he came back, and he's been traveling all around the country speaking about Darfur. And I have some of his pictures uh, that I'll show you. If I could just have the lights, I mean, I'm going to end up being a disembodied voice here coming out of the darkness, but I really want you to be able to see these pictures. And, and uh, I know that um, uh, actually, if I was getting an honorarium, I would donate it so that you could buy a dimmer switch. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, if we could turn off the lights so you can see these pictures a little bit better. And I also have to see this keyboard. But. Um, the, the title that, that I always use is Who Will Survive Today? And uh, this is also, we have a special exhibition in the Holocaust Museum in Washington um, by the same title about Darfur, Who Will Survive Today? And there are two things that I want to emphasize about that title. The first thing is that we're talking about today. Uh, I come from an institution that's a memorial to victims of the Holocaust. Uh, that deals first and foremost with an historical event, things in the past. But when we're talking about Darfur, we are not talking about the past. We are talking about lives that are hanging in the balance, even as I speak to you right now. And that brings me to the second thing that I always emphasize. It is that it's a question. 
Who will survive today is a question, and we don't know the answer to it. When we uh, at the Holocaust Museum teach about the Holocaust or when we train teachers to teach about the Holocaust, one of the things that we emphasize is that just because something happened doesn't mean that it was inevitable. Just because the Holocaust happened does not mean that it was inevitable. It was the product of choices. Choices made by many people, including choices made by bystanders. And the same thing is true in Darfur from here on out. What is going to happen in Darfur is not inevitable, even though there are some very negative trends. What is going to happen is going to be the product of choices, choices that are made on the ground in Darfur, for sure, and choices that are made in the Sudanese capital of, of Khartoum, but also choices that are being made uh, in Washington, D.C. And we, as citizens, in turn, can influence those choices by the choices that we make, whether to stand up and speak out uh, or to remain silent. Our choices will play a part in answering this question of who will survive today. One thing I just want to say about this photograph, uh, I took this photograph and I just remember so vividly talking to these people. It was a couple of older gentlemen and women and children and they told me uh, stories similar to ones I'm going to relate to you about their villages being destroyed, being attacked, people being shot, people being killed, the villages being burned. And after they had told me their story, this older gentleman made this gesture that I caught with my camera. And he folded his hands and he ducked his head and he said, well now this grandfather can be happy because I know somebody's taking our story back to America. And all the refugees that I talked to were so eager to tell their stories and they really believed that if people knew what was happening to them that there would be help. There would be help coming to them. And uh, it reminded me of something that I've heard from many, many Holocaust survivors that I've had the privilege of meeting. How many of them during the Holocaust felt abandoned? They felt abandoned and they carry that feeling of abandonment with them 60 years still later, 60 years later. And these people that I met in, in Chad, these refugees, these people who had lost almost everything were desperate not to feel abandoned. Let me just orient you for a second about the place that we're talking about. And I just have to say that the situation in Darfur is, is very, very complex. And it's always a challenge to respect that complexity but not lose sight of the moral contours of the situation. So let me just tell you the moral contours of the situation. They are this, that over the course of the last two and a half years or more, the civilian population in the western region of Darfur, which you see on the map there, from certain ethnic groups, so-called non-Arab ethnic groups or African ethnic groups, have been under assault from the government of Sudan and uh, allies that, that it has enlisted from some of the so-called Arab ethnic groups in Darfur. And during that assault, over two million people have been driven from their homes. Hundreds of thousands have perished. We don't know exactly how many. Maybe it's 200,000. Maybe it's 300,000, maybe it's more than 400,000, and there are some reasonable estimates that suggest it's that high. But we know that it's hundreds of thousands of people, some of whom have been the victims of direct violence. They've been murdered. Um, others have perished because of the conditions of life that have been inflicted upon them. They've been driven into a desert, and I'm going to show you what, that, what it looks like, uh, where they can't survive without outside assistance. And for a long time, the government of Sudan was, was effectively blocking outside assistance. Uh, un under international pressure, uh, some of those obstacles have been relieved. But even today, the security situation is getting worse. And as a consequence, the ability of international aid to reach people who need it is getting severely threatened. Thousands of women have been raped. Thousands of women have been raped. And they've been raped not just because they're women, but because they're members of a certain group. It is part of an assault on the groups that these women are members of. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of villages have been destroyed, burnt to the ground, and I'll show you images of that. Those are the moral contours of this situation. It is a civilian population that has been uh, the target of an unrelenting assault by the government of Sudan. Why is all this happening? Well, I don't have time to give you the full in-depth history of Sudan, but let me just try to give you a few, a few of the uh, key points. 
Um, basically, if you look at the map of Sudan here, and to give you a sense of, Sudan is the largest country in Africa. It's often said that it is the size of the United States east of the Mississippi. Um, so it's quite large. Darfur itself is quite large. It's uh, the size, well, people often say it's the size of France or Texas, but another way to think of it is it's the size of California. So it, it's, it's a big territory. And one thing about uh, Sudan, the country which became independent in 1956, is that historically, since independence and even before then, the power and the wealth in this area have been controlled uh, from the capital of Khartoum. Um, one expert once described Sudan as being similar to a big sink, and Khartoum is the drain. And so all the wealth and the power have flowed down that drain. And the, the areas on the periphery have been marginalized. They've been economically marginalized. They've been marginalized politically. Uh, many of you may have heard for, for literally decades there was conflict in southern Sudan because the, the people who live in the south were rebelling against this marginalization. And I should, I should, I should add that this, this uh, um, situation of marginalization is tied to, to identity. It's tied to identity in a couple of different ways. The most important is that the, the people in Khartoum who have traditionally held power in Sudan um, identify themselves as Arabs. They're sometimes called Sudanese Arabs. Um, and uh, they have um, had a, uh, a vision that, that everyone in Sudan should, should adopt um, Arab culture, Arabic language, and the Islamic religion. And many of the people who are on the periphery have different identities, particularly in the south, the southern part of the country, where uh, they're generally non-Muslim, they're generally, they're overwhelmingly non-Arab. And so those issues of identity uh, combined with the issues of marginalization to create a lot of the, the, uh, the potential for mass violence. And so in the course of the southern conflict, uh, several million people died. They were either killed directly or again fell victims to conditions of life that were inflicted upon them. Well, in early 2000, and, or in 2001, 2002, a huge diplomatic effort, which was partly led by the United States, started to make progress to resolve this conflict in the South. And uh, as progress was being made um, on the basis of power sharing and wealth sharing, the uh, population in Darfur, especially the non-Arab population in Darfur, saw that the national pie was getting re-sliced and the Southerners were going to get a piece, but they weren't going to get a piece. And so they, uh, a rebellion began in early 2003. And the rebel groups drew their recruits largely, as I said, from the non-Arab ethnic groups in, um, in Darfur. And the government's response was, well, if these rebels come from the non-Arab ethnic groups, then uh, if we get rid of those ethnic groups, we'll get rid of the rebels. And so that's when they launched this assault that I've described on the civilian population of the, of the non-Arab ethnic groups. Uh, sometimes you see in the press a reference to Arab versus African. And that's a real oversimplification. Um, but unfortunately, the concept of distinct Arab and African identities have become more and more uh, salient in Darfur and in Sudan in general over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so. Um, but uh, the, the, the bottom line is that um, these ethnic groups, whether you call them African or non-Arab or black, because sometimes there's a connotation of, of different skin color, these, uh, these ethnic groups have been targeted basically for destruction by the government of Sudan. And in doing so, it has, the government has uh, enlisted, as I said, allies from some of the Arab groups in Darfur. And it's important to recognize that not all of the Arab groups in Darfur are involved in this conflict. But the ones who are involved are the ones who have uh, the most tenuous connection to land and who are the poorest and who uh, see the potential for economic gain by uh, joining with the uh, government in driving these uh, other ethnic groups off the land. This is what the desert looks like. This is in Chad, but the desert extends into, um, um, into uh, Sudan. And so when I talk about villages being destroyed, people fleeing, this is what they flee into. And when I visited 
the first time to Chad in May of 2004, um, which is when I took this picture, the daily high was about 115 or 120 degrees. Very, very hot, very, very dry. And the further north you go on that map that I showed you, the, uh, the hotter and drier it gets. But this was about in the middle of, of the, the area along the border. Um, so it's, it's plenty dry there. Um, the, the weather in, in, uh, in this area, this region, is uh, generally nine months of the year it's dry. Uh, and then they have a rainy season from about July to September. And I'll show you in a little while pictures of the rainy season. Uh, you'll recognize it because it's very much like what's outside today. Um, they get these, these drenching downpours and they, that creates problems in and of itself. But most of the time it's very, very dry. This is just more of the desert. And when I, uh, my first trip, uh, I should say, I didn't make this clear, uh, over two million people have been driven from their homes. A portion of those people, about 200,000, have crossed over into Chad and are refugees. The rest of the displaced are still inside Darfur, and they are very much at risk, uh, and they're still subject to attacks. And unfortunately, over the course of about the last three months, after a period of some stability, the security situation has started to get worse, and there have been more attacks on uh, civilians. And, and the United Nations recently said that uh, in the last month or so, 200,000 people have been newly displaced or in some instances re-displaced. They were people who had already driven their from their villages and now they've been displaced again. So that's 200,000 new displacements just in the last month or so. Um, when uh, people first started, oh, and the other thing I should say about Chad is that unfortunately the violence is starting to spill over the border and there have been increasing attacks across the border into Chad. And so now people who are in Chad, uh, it's not clear how safe that they will continue to be. Um, uh, these, they're living in refugee camps that are basically 25 to 50 miles from the border and so they're not that far away from the border. Uh, when people first came through there were, uh, the United Nations started setting up camps. This is one of those camps um, and there weren't enough tents for people. People were living in makeshift shelters that uh, they made out of plastic sheeting. The uh, aid agencies would give them plastic sheeting and then they would use sticks and cloth to create a little hut. And you can imagine what it would be like to have a family of five living in one of those huts uh, when it's 115 degrees outside. Uh, you can also see, and I'll show you a picture of this later, but that blurriness in the background is sand. And uh, a very common occurrence is a daily sandstorm where the wind starts blowing and uh, uh, there's just sand everywhere. I should say, uh, I don't remember if I have pictures in this collection, yeah. This is, this is from my more recent trip, which was last uh, July. <coughs> and you can see that the, uh, uh, m most of the refugees in Chad now are in tents, although they were starting to complain. They were complaining that the tents were ripping, that there were holes in the tents. And this was during the rainy season, so they'd be getting rain coming into their tents. You can also see that things are greener because this was during the rainy season. So just as in California, when it rains, you get, you get more greenness. Um, but people are, are living very, very close together. They have almost nothing. They left everything behind, or most of it was stolen by the Sudanese military or these militias, these so-called Janjaweed militias. And uh, it was very sad. Uh, one of the people who took me around had been a sheikh, so he'd been one of the four leaders in his village. And uh, he had two compounds. He had goats. He had camels. He had horses. I don't remember if he had horses. He had donkeys for sure. Uh, here, he's got none of that. It's all gone. This is what people inside Darfur are living in. They don't have nearly as much access to aid. They're not well organized camps. Uh, it's basically, I mean, if you look at this, it looks like a trash dump. And uh, this is this, the conditions in which people are trying to survive. Makeshift shelters, uh, uh, huddling as close together as possible in order to uh, try to be safe. This was a picture that uh, my friend Brian Steidel took, as I said. So this is from inside Darfur. Uh, on my first trip, some of the people that I met were not even in camps or didn't even have huts. They were literally living under trees. Uh, and this woman was living under this tree. It was about 100 yards from the, from the border. Uh, she had just crossed over a couple of days before uh, with a group of about 60 refugee families. And uh, 
they had, I don't remember how long she had been walking. Some of the people I met had been walking for a couple of weeks through the desert to get to Chad. And the people who went to Chad were the ones who were closest to begin with. I mean, if people could get to the border, that's what they did to try to get away from the violence. Um, and you can see what this woman brought with her when she fled. She, there are some jugs, some pots, some blankets. That's what's left of what she had. What's more difficult to see is that she has two bullet wounds in her right leg, one right below the knee and one right at the bottom of her right foot. And uh, she was shot when she and a 17-year-old girl went to a well to get water for themselves and other refugees who were fleeing. And a soldier was guarding the well. Now you think about that for a minute. You've destroyed people's villages. You put them into this desert, which you've just seen a picture of, where you can't survive without water. And then you're guarding the wells so that they can't get water. Well, she, she and the 17-year-old girl approached the well and... Uh, uh, the soldier grabbed the 17-year-old girl, and so this woman tried to pull the girl back, and that's when the soldier shot her. And he took the girl away to a nearby army encampment, uh, and they found the girl a couple of days later. She was still alive, but she was covered in blood, and both of her legs had been broken, probably to keep her from running away. And this is one anecdote, but the use of sexual violence against civilians has been extensively documented by the United Nations, by international human rights organizations, by international journalists, and by the United States government. Um, it has been part and parcel of this assault on the civilian population, is the use of sexual violence. And sexual violence that, as I said before, is aimed at women as members of the group. Uh, there have been a lot of accounts, including in the Washington Post, of women who are recounting being gang raped. And as they're being gang raped, um, their attackers are taunting them with racial epithets or they're saying, when we get finished uh, here, you, we're making light-skinned babies. There aren't going to be any black skins left uh, around here when we're finished. Uh, and it's part of this idea that there's a racial difference between the so-called Arabs and the so-called Africans. Even though objectively this might not be true, it's part of the discourse uh, in Darfur, and it's part of, of the, the uh, discourse that surrounds this uh, attack on the civilian populations. <coughs> This just shows this area where this woman was sit sitting was just one of the bleakest places that I ever hoped to see. Uh, it was all of these trees just spread out, and under each tree, people had plopped down to try to get a little shade. This was pretty far north, so it was very, very, very hot. And one thing about this area, there were, there were uh, dead animals all over the place, people who had managed to salvage a couple of goats or a few donkeys when they fled. Uh, they got here and their animals were dying because it was so dry and there was no food. And uh, I'm, I don't have the pictures as part of this collection, but, but um, there are pictures of these mounds of donkeys and goats going up in flames because uh, the International Rescue Committee was there and they had organized an effort to try to collect these, these carcasses and burn them to try to prevent the spread of disease, but there were just dead animals every place. Uh, there were about 10,000 people who were spread out in this area. Um, uh, as I said, just exhausted. They had just crossed over the, from the border. This was uh, women who were probably waiting to get water, uh, especially on the first, the first time I was there in Chad, water was a real problem. I mean, this is a desert, and you've got people living in much greater concentrations than they had been before. Uh, so the water problems were not as acute in July when I was there, uh, uh, although, again, in the more northern camps, it's, it's still a problem. Uh, this is what the rainy season looks like. And, uh, as I said, very similar to the weather that we had today here. <coughs> what the rainy season means is about three months of monsoonic downpours. So it rained for 30 minutes to two hours every day. And uh, that creates its own problem. Uh, most uh, especially, you can see that everything fills up with water. But um, the uh, wadis, which are dry during the dry season, fill up with, with water. Uh, and uh, the roads go through the wadis, and so uh, transporting 
aid and transporting goods becomes much more difficult uh, once it starts raining. A lot of trucks get stop, stuck. Here was a United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees truck, and uh, you know, the roads can be impassable for 24 hours or more at a time. This was a list that was created by the refugees in one of the uh, camps that I visited on my first trip. And what they had done is they had compiled a list of massacres that they had witnessed. And one thing you'll see is it's uh, in rough English. And uh, because they're writing it down to share with people like me and other people who are coming through. And this goes again to the idea of how desperate they were to tell their stories and, and to not feel abandoned and to get the word out. And you can see they've, the columns are the number of people who died, the place where the attack happened, the, the nature of the attack. Um, this first line where you see it says uh, GA, uh, which is short for Janjaweed, uh, meaning the Arab militia that's allied with the government. And then the second word is Antonov. It's a phonetic spelling of Antonov. Antonov is a type of airplane that the Sudanese Air Force has. And so a very common form of attack is that an Antonov would fly over a village and uh, Antonovs are not actually bombers, they're cargo planes but they've been adapted by the Sudanese to use as bombers and they would lower the ramp, the back ramp and they would roll out 55 gallon drums uh, filled with gunpowder and nails and metal and glass, uh, they're kind of makeshift bombs and so they would drop these bombs on a village um, and if anyone was near the bomb when it went off, they would be killed or maimed. But then everyone else would start running around in terror. It was a weapon of terror. And then the Janjaweed would come in on the ground and start shooting people. Uh, and then after they had, the survivors had fled, the, uh, uh, they would, the Janjaweed would systematically loot the village, take all the proper, property that they wanted, uh, and then they would burn the village. Um, and as uh, I'll show you a picture of village going up, but Brian Steidel, who witnessed some of these attacks, and what was remarkable is these attacks would happen even if the African Union mo monitors are standing there. Um, but he says it takes a lot of commitment to burn a village. I mean, you don't just light one of these comp one one hut and the rest go up. You have to do each one. But that's what they did all throughout Darfur. Sorry, the. Uh, The keyboard is uh, not, there we go. This was uh, one of many refugees that I talked to. This young guy, I think he was, I can't remember, 19 or 20 years old. I met him on my, my uh, more recent trip. And uh, he had come to Chad looking for his parents. They had gotten separated when their village was attacked. And uh, he had been to several refugee camps and hadn't found them. Similarly, this woman um, I met on my first trip, and uh, she told me about when her village was attacked. And on that day, her uh, father was killed, and her brother was killed, and her cousin was killed, and 33 other people, or 30 other people in her village were killed, and her mother disappeared, and, uh, uh, and she fled. And when I... Uh, heard this story. This was on my first trip and I'd been hearing story after story after story like this and I'd been in these camps for about 10 days and it was one of these days where it was very, very hot and we were in one of those makeshift huts and it was very, very oppressive in there. Uh, and I was sitting there with her four kids and her and uh, there was an older neighbor and uh, my translator and I was just overwhelmed by the suffering and by her story and I felt a strong urge to to distance myself from it and to at least get out of the hut and get into the well, relative open air of the camp. And so I thanked her for her story and I started to back out of the hut. And then she started speaking in a very low voice. And I looked over at her and tears were splashing down on her cheeks. And she was saying, what about my mother? Where's my mother? I don't even know if she's alive or if she's dead. And I felt as though she were asking me to give her an answer which I couldn't possibly do. Uh, and the only thing I could think to say is, tell me your mother's name and I'll take, I'll take her name back and tell other people and you'll know that people in America are thinking about your mother. And her mother's name is Hadiya Ahmed. 
Hadiya Ahmed, which is actually a very common female name in Darfur. And so as I've traveled around and told this story and told people about this, um, the significance to me of this is that as vast as the catastrophe is, two million people is a number that's very difficult to understand. Hundreds of thousands of people dead is difficult to understand. It's not about those numbers. It's about one woman who doesn't know where her mother is and probably won't know until there's peace and security in Darfur. A lot of kids in these camps, um, and as I started out by saying, I have two small children who are four and seven, and two girls, and so this particularly touched me to see so many kids. Some of the kids are living in the moment the way the kids do whenever they get the opportunity. Um, this girl saw me taking a picture of the donkey, and so she wanted to be in it, so she came and started <laughs> playing games with the donkey. But there are also uh, a lot of the kids who are bearing tremendous burdens, and they're at risk. Uh, this baby, uh, on my first trip, children were dying. In one camp that I went to, seven kids had died in the 11 days before I got there, basically from the effects of having to flee and malnutrition. Um, the st situation uh, in Chad and to a lesser extent in Darfur has stabilized more since then. But one thing you'll see about this girl uh, if you look at her hair, it's kind of copper colored. And a doctor that I traveled with on my mo more recent trip said that's a sign of uh, inadequate micronutrients, this copper colored hair. And you start looking around and most of the kids have copper colored hair when it should be really, really dark. And you know what that means, these kids aren't dying of malnutrition, although they're at greater risk of dying just because they're weaker. Um, but they're not developing in the way they should. They're not getting what they need to develop. And so their future is really being taken from them. It's very, it's very subtle, but it's, it's very, very insidious. Uh, this was Doctors Without Borders is one of the groups that's working there, running feeding clinics, uh, working to identify children who uh, um, are undernourished. And this was one such girl uh, that they had just identified that day. Um, once they start treating kids, then the kids definitely are out of danger, at least immediate danger. I mean, they do get them back on the... Uh, track of being, um, uh, not being in danger of dying immediately. That's another, you can see the girl's, the copper color on her hair. She was in the Doctors Without Borders feeding. A lot of orphans, kids who end up in Chad with no family members. Red Cross has put up posters to, with pictures of these kids in hopes that Either their parents may still be alive or, uh, or other family members will see them and, and so that they can get reunited. People looking at. <coughs> Sorry about this being kind of slow. The, there we go. Um, a lot of kids, obviously, as I said, bearing burdens. This, uh, you know, when. When people fled, they mostly walked, and as I said, sometimes it could be, uh, they could have walked for a couple of weeks to get to Chad, and basically this girl would have probably carried her brother uh, during that time period. This girl looked to me like she was very traumatized. They had just crossed over a couple of days before I met her. This was on my first trip. And for the girls, or for the kids who are still in Darfur, uh, they are at tremendous risk. This is one of the pictures taken by Brian Steidel, one of his first pictures actually. And this girl was being carried on her mother's back. They wrapped their infants with, their, their, with cloth on their backs and they were fleeing and she was shot through the back. Her mother was killed and the girl was in very bad shape. Uh, the Red Cross went back the next day and they couldn't find the girl so Brian doesn't know what happened to, to her. This was also another one of his pictures. This boy was one of a hundred people who were killed in his village. There's actually a picture, uh, a, a picture of, a boy, of a boy right next to this one. Uh, this picture was run in the New York Times. I'll show you in just a minute, four pictures that they ran on the op-ed page, which is very unusual. There was another picture that I'm not going to show you that they wouldn't run because it was too graphic, but basically 
it was a boy who looked like he might have been this boy's older brother uh, who had had his face bashed in with a rifle butt. These were the pictures that were in the New York Times. And this, uh, these are pictures from Brian showing villages, a village being destroyed. And you can see that <laughs> the, uh, it does take a lot of commitment to burn one of these villages. These people live um, somewhat spread out. They don't, they're not all crowded together the way that they're living now. Um, and setting one compound on fire doesn't mean that the whole village is going to go up. Um, it, it takes a lot of work. But uh, that work's been done in village after village after village. And so you can see here an entire village going up. This is a picture of, the, of a sandstorm that I promised you. This picture was basically taken at noon, you know, at, at the middle of the day. And you couldn't see more than a couple of hundred yards uh, just because the haboob is what they call it, but the wind is blowing the sand. And to me, it, uh, it symbolizes the situation that the Darfurians find themselves in. They, uh, it's a storm, and it's very hard to see what's going to happen. Um, but as I said, um, the, what will happen is going to depend upon the choices that are still being made, including choices that we make <coughs> ourselves. So I hope you're asking, well, what can I do? And I just want to make a couple of suggestions. Uh, first and foremost, <laughs> uh, and let me come back to it, is uh, support the Human Rights Club, the events that they're doing, and then on April 30th, come down to the Golden Gate Bridge and to Chrissy Field and be part of this, this national day of, of action, day of raising our voices on Darfur. Uh, but don't stop there. Uh, April, you know, whatever we do on April 30th is not going to be the end of the story. Uh, and I'll give you some other suggestions. There we go. Keep informed. Uh, the basis of effective action is knowledge. And uh, one place that you can go to find constant news updates is our website, which is uh, www.committeeonconscience, all one word, .org. I'll show you that again in just a minute. Uh, and one thing that we have on there is actually an award-winning uh, uh, internet-based talk show called Voices on Genocide Prevention. It's a weekly show, weekly interview program that I host. And uh, um, um, it deals with genocide issues broadly, but uh, obviously a lot of our attention is focused on Darfur. And we talk to human rights activists. We talk to government officials. We talk to analysts. Um, it's a good way to, to learn more about wh what's happening and why it's happening. Um, the second thing is to contact the media. And uh, by that, I mean. Let your local media know that you care about this issue and that you want them to care about it. The local paper should be editorializing on this. There's no excuse for editorial pages not to be writing editorials about genocide in Darfur. Um, what is their stand on it? What do they think should be done? Um, and that's very important because our government officials read the local editorial pages, and that's one way that they get a sense of what it is that their constituents care about. The uh, third thing is very similar, communicate with the government. Um, and it's uh, very important that our government know that there is a constituency that cares about Darfur. Um, and as I said, we've seen movement in the last six weeks uh, at the highest levels in Washington. But that is not a signal that we should let up. It's actually a signal that we need to redouble our efforts to reinforce uh, the attention that's being paid and to convey the sense that this is something that the public cares about. Ultimately, the level of priority that is given to a situation like Darfur is going to depend upon the extent to which the uh, representatives in Congress and in the White House uh, think that there is a, a public, uh, public concern about the issue. Uh, support relief and education efforts. And I know that everyone can do that uh, this evening <laughs> by going to Chevy's Chevy's in, uh, in Santa Rosa, um, and I think the Human Rights Club will talk about that. But uh, I always emphasize both of these things. There is a continuing need for, uh, to contribute to aid efforts in the region, and that doesn't solve the problem. It does ameliorate the suffering. But we also can't lose sight of the need to educate people here. 
and to support efforts uh, that uh, are being undertaken to spread the word, whether it's the Human Rights Club or it's Tim Nunn's Dear Sudan uh, effort or, uh, if I can say so, the Committee on Conscience at the Holocaust Museum. And then finally, make this a community effort. I mean, and that's what's so important about students. Students at campuses all over the country have been doing the same thing that the Human Rights Club here is doing. They're making it a campus-wide effort. And the students have been in the vanguard of raising awareness about Darfur, in clamoring for, for action, and in calling for uh, attention to be paid to this. And that is making a tremendous difference. And I've said it now several times, but I will finish by saying we cannot let up now. We cannot let up now. Uh, the efforts are starting to bear some fruit, and we have to just redouble those efforts. And um, so I just want to finish with an invitation to you to, uh, to join us in redoubling those efforts and to make this part of, of what you're doing. So thank you. <laughs> Time for questions. Yeah, um, it's, it's not that the, uh, uh, the Chadian rebels are colluding with the Sudanese refugees. Uh, it's more that, that there are Chadian rebels that are being supported by the Sudanese government. And uh, uh, they are in, uh, so they formed up in Darfur, so they're across the border. And they launched an uh, assault on a Chadian border town in December. And they've been threatening to attack again. So, uh, so there has been this related issue that the Chadian government is, uh, uh, claims that it needs to use revenues that it's starting to get from oil production uh, to, to, to buy weapons. Uh, it's all part, the larger picture, which it's all part of, is that this is not just limited to Darfur. I mean, as bad as the situation is, and I think that it would be sufficient for, for us to care about it, it's becoming a regional problem. And the Chadian government uh, is, is getting destabilized by the situation. Um, it was not that stable to begin with. And uh, Chad itself has a lot of fissures, has a history of conflict. And so um, if, if it melted down, the scope of the crisis would, would just increase exponentially. So it's a very dangerous thing. And that's what I referred to earlier, that the, the conflict is spilling over the border. And it's very, very dangerous. And as you say, one of the, the ways that the Chadian government's responded is by saying that we can't use this money for social purposes. We've got to use it for military. The UN. Well, the UN, um, uh, when we think about the UN, it's important to think of it in two different ways. One is kind of the U UN bu bureaucracy, which does certain operational things, like provide food deliver food aid or assist refugees. And in that sense, it's very, it's very deeply engaged. As you saw that truck from UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, they're helping coordinate the refugee effort in Chad, the World Food Program's coordinating food delivery. Um, so on that operational level, it's very involved. Uh, but the second way to think about the UN is as a political club of nations, United Nations. And the, uh, and the power in that club is the UN Security Council. And uh, the Security Council so far, and the power in the Security Council uh, are especially the five permanent members, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia. And uh, so far, the Security Council has really just taken a series of half steps. Um, and uh, the... Uh, um, what remains to be seen over the course of the... Now, I mean, what's in play now is will they finally take full steps, including the full step of authorizing a, uh, a UN force to, to augment and, and give power
power to the African Union force that's already there. And the politics of it are very difficult. China, in particular, has been very obstructionist. Um, so it's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people have been calling for greater U.S. push in the United Nations, and that's starting to happen. One challenge that the U.S. is facing is then getting other countries to cooperate. But, you know, it's a diplomatic issue that if there's enough uh, will and energy brought to bear by the United States, it, 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 can, have, it can have definite influence. Jerry, you mentioned that about two million people in Darfur have been displaced. Roughly how many villages have not been liquidated? What on a percentage basis do any remain? Well, my understanding, I don't know that anyone actually knows, but my understanding from talking to people who have been on the ground and, and have a sense of things uh, is that, that well over 80% of the non-Arab villages have been, have been destroyed. Um, and I don't know how accurate that is, but that's the number that I've heard. So, so the overwhelming majority, I think, of, uh, of both the non-Arab population and, and the, has been displaced, and the, and the villages in turn have been uh, destroyed. Sometimes people flee before their village is attacked because other villages have been attacked. And so I think there are cases, and I've seen videos of villages that are empty but not destroyed, but there have been an enormous number of villages that were burnt to the ground. Most of this was done uh, in uh, 2003, 2004, and early 2005. Um, and then there have been, in some cases, people filtering back to their villages or going back to the villages to, to try to do some agriculture but then staying displaced. Um, and so that's why there may still be villages to be destroyed. It's people have moved back to villages that weren't destroyed in the first place but that they had fled. Uh -huh. The civilians from the Arab groups that are otherwise involved with the militias? Um, well, that's a good question. I, I don't know exactly. Um, they uh, often, the, <laughs> I mean, the stories, and Brian Steidel particularly tells these stories, this looting a village is, is a, uh, a broad-based effort. So you would have the militia, who are men, come in and do the killing and the driving people off, but then uh, you'd have their family members come along b behind to help um, uh, uh, loot, loot the village, collect the, the stuff that's being stolen and organize it. And, and then they would borrow trucks from the Sudanese military or otherwise get trucks to haul it away. Um, if you go to our website, there's some more of Brian's pictures. And I'm pretty sure the one of the pictures we have on there is, is a picture from a helicopter of these people sorting through the loot. And you can see it's not just the, the militia men, it's, it's the broader community that's, that's involved in that. Is there much intermarriage between the Arab and non-Arab populations? And how does that come to play if it is in Rwanda? Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is there's been a fair amount of intermarriage. And, and that in general, this, these concepts of identity are very fluid, and they change over time. And uh, um, historically, people, either through marriage or changing their lifestyle, one thing that, didn't, that kind of demarks the difference between the groups is, is lifestyle. The uh, so-called Africans tend to be more sedentary, and the Arabs are, nom are nomadic. Um, and if people change their lifestyle, they could kind of adopt a different identity. Um, but the, the identities have gotten more rigid over the last 10 or 20 years for a variety of reasons. Increased conflict over resources, uh, ideology, especially uh, the, the presence of a, what might be called Arab supremacist ideology um, that was both contributed to by the government in Khartoum but also uh, was spread by Libya's Muammar Gaddafi in the 70s and 80s. Um, so all, all of these things led to rigidification of, of identity. Um, and in, in larger towns and villages, the population can be more mixed, although my sense is that villages in the countryside tend to be one group or another. Again, 
you know, partly a, a product of the lifestyle. Well, there there are, um, uh, although to call them camps uh, may be kind of an exaggeration because they're not that well organized. I mean, I showed that one picture. That that's a quote unquote camp. It's more conglomerations of people uh, that can be large. I mean, if you were organizing a camp, having a camp that's got more than twenty five or thirty thousand people, you wouldn't do. And in some of these, there's one hundred fifty thousand people who are who are kind of gathered together in one spot. Um, now, the United Nations and international aid agencies are are trying to provide relief in these places, but their ability to operate and to organize in the way that they have done in Chad, where the camps are fairly, fairly well organized and established, uh, they just haven't been able to do that. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the African Union forces that were there. I heard something in the late fall, there were like 5,000 troops or something. Are they actively engaging the militias, or are they serving more as a, a policing force or a peacekeeping force? Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, originally, let me just take you back a little bit to give you an idea of why they're there, and then that helps answer the question of what they're doing. Originally, in April of 2004, uh, the uh, government and the, the rebels that the government was seeking to, to fight or not fight, but were the reasons that they were attacking these civilian populations, agreed to a ceasefire. Uh, and as part of the ceasefire, they agreed that they would invite the African Union to send in monitors to monitor the ceasefire. And so originally there were a few hundred, there were, there were a few dozen monitors, and then the monitors came with a protection force, not to protect civilians, but to protect the monitors. And, and that was a few hundred people. And so they came in and, <clears throat> again, this is in a place the size of California, so a few hundred people wandering around. And the ceasefire was never honored. I mean, it was a joke. Um, but that did get the African Union in on the ground. And so uh, uh, there, the main diplomatic effort to try to provide some protection to civilians has been expanding that African Union force. Its primary mission is still monitoring the ceasefire, not to protect civilians. But what they have done in certain places is uh, uh, provide some protection. For example, accompany women out to collect firewood from these, these big camps, these big conglomerations. Because when the women would go out, if men went out, they would be killed. If women went out, they were sexually assaulted. And, uh, um, but they had to have firewood. I mean, it was a terrible dilemma for them. So in some places, the African Union will go out with them and in that sense provide protection. Um, and now the force has grown so that it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,000. Um, but it still really doesn't have a civilian protection mandate. And it's not that capable. I mean, it, it is not as well armed as everybody else. <laughs> I mean, including the government and the Janjaweed militia. And then the rebels. The rebels are not angels and they've been responsible for attacking humanitarian aid workers. I mean, the scale of bad things they've done is dwarfed by the scale of bad things done by the government and, and the Janjaweed militias. But the, the bottom line is that the African Union is the weakest force on the ground there. And uh, there have been some very embarrassing episodes where uh, a bunch of, or a number of AU soldiers were taken hostage. And so they sent a force to try to free the hostages, and they got taken hostage as well. And uh, it's, they don't have very good communications equipment. Uh, they don't have intelligence. They don't have, for the most part, good transport. Um, so that is one thing that has finally led to a recognition that there's got to be a, a broader force and a multinational force, that there's just not the capacity there to protect civilians, um, even when they want to. And You mean in normal times? Yeah. If they want well, to in normal times, um, I mean it's not it's not the Bay Area, <laughs> it's not Northern California, yeah. but but they do have agriculture, 
the rainy season comes in, and this was remarkable. You know, the first time I went, I kind of had this feeling, well, how does anyone live here? But, um, but going back last July in the rainy season, uh, it does transform the countryside. And so, and you can see people uh, plowing fields, often by hand. I mean, this back-breaking work. But some, also they had donkeys, so the donkeys they would use to plow. And so they would plant sorghum or millet and, and grow enough to, to keep them going. And then there's a lot of their wild berries. There's all kinds of different uh, things. Um, uh, and the population's fairly spread out. So, you know, it won't support big, huge cities and towns. But So people can live there and they live, yeah, I mean, part of their wealth is in their livestock. And you would ask people, I would ask refugees, so well, what did you have? And assuming that the answers were accurate, I mean, they had a couple, of, a fairly wealthy person would have a couple of camels, would have a, a bunch of goats, would have a number of donkeys. And so, yeah, they, they made a living. Um, but uh, obviously in Darfur, if you're driven off your land and you can't do any of that planning or anything, then, and your livestock gets stolen, then you get very poor very quickly. Uh, in Chad, uh, it has, just having so many more people on the land has created a lot of stress on the environment. I mean, there's not enough water, there's not enough wood. If you think about those uh, makeshift huts that were made with wood, well, you saw what the train looks like. There's not a lot of wood. And then also all those people are going out to collect wood for their fires every, every night. I mean, they cook over fires. So it's putting a tremendous amount of stress. And the consequence is that um, the, uh, for example, malnutrition among the host population in Chad has gone up. So the Chadian population has suffered a lot by virtue of having this situation happen. And in fact, there's one thing that we found in July when I was there is that there's increasing tensions. At first, the Chadian population was fairly welcoming and there are ethnic ties across the border. And, but, but now there's a lot of tension and you know, it's just scarce resources becoming scarcer. Well, my personal feeling on that is that um, uh, governments on issues that don't, well, governments' perception of their interests are driven in part by some basics, like you protect your territory, and secondly, by in a democracy, what your population defines as, it, as its interests. And when you have a situation like Darfur, it doesn't matter if you call it genocide or not, uh, if there's not political pressure to do something, then most political leaders are not going to invest a lot into it. And so, so I think that's the reason. And I think that continues to be a problem. We're making a lot of progress in the United States. Our government is feeling that this is in their interest to do something about, in part because of citizens. Um, uh, one challenge that we do have is that there's not as strong a citizen movement in other countries, especially other countries, Western countries, that could be doing more. Um, and we've got a limited ability to influence that, but that's part of the challenge. But ultimately, you know, I think many of you will have heard of this treaty called the Genocide Convention, which was adopted in 1948. The whole, the whole concept of genocide was a product of basically what we today call the Holocaust. And in 1948, um, this multilateral treaty was adopted that's called the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. And uh, many people have thought that that somehow obligates governments to stop genocide when it's happening. And so a lot of people who put effort into getting in the United States to say what was happening in Darfur was genocide, thought that then there would be an obligation to do something. And I won't go into the whole thing because we're getting near the end of our time, but the convention doesn't really say that. But the bottom line is that governments are never going to stop genocide out of a sense of legal obligation. They're only going to stop genocide out of a sense of political or practical necessity. And that comes back to citizens. If citizens demand that their leaders act to stop genocide, then that's when we'll start stopping genocide. And until we demand that they do that, we're going to have replays of the situations that we've seen in Darfur, where it's taken a long time to get to the point where we are now. Rwanda, where nothing was done. Bosnia, where you know years went by 
and we had the worst massacre on the European continent since the end of World War II before there was a, such a political outcry in the United States that the United States had to get off the dime. All right, with that, I'll hand it over to the Human Rights Club. to introduce yourselves. Okay. okay, my name is Janelle. I'm the treasurer of the Human Rights Club. I'm Lauren. I'm the president. And are you going to say anything? Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, our club got started as a result of Jerry Fowler's lecture last semester. So hopefully um, a lot of you will choose to become a part of our club as a result of his lecture this semester. Um, we are going to send around a thing. Yeah. This is magic. <laughs> We're going to send around magic, apparently. And um, this is to raise money for um, the Saved Our Four Coalition, which is where all of our money for our club that we raise goes to. And they are a committee, an alliance of over 100 other organizations all throughout the country, one of them being the Holocaust Memorial Museum. So we are going to send our, um, our money to that organization. And... So now we'll tell you more. This, this bowl comes to us from a Rwandan survivor as a gift, and we use it to pass around so that we can uh, share a gift back. So whatever you can. Um, and just to let you know a little bit about our club, last semester we did a Darfur campaign. It was one week, and we were able to raise about $500 that we sent to SaveDarfur.org. This semester last, we did a two-week, we're doing a two-week campaign. This is our last week. Um, so far, we raised $300 last week, and we hope to raise, in total, over $800 in profits. That would be, that's a good goal for us. So if you guys could all help us out. Um, some of our events, we're selling t-shirts, like the ones I'm wearing right now. Um, they're $15 each, and we are also selling the bracelets. They're green. They say, not on my watch, or not on our watch. And the other things, we're having the Baja Fresh fundraiser, which is until Friday. If you eat there and mention you're with the Human Rights Club or, you know, just mention our name. They'll donate 15% of your bill. And then tonight we're having our big Chevy's fundraiser. If you come with us, we're inviting everyone, the community, um, Myrna, and our professors, and Jerry Fowler, if you want to come. Um, they will donate 20% of the proceeds or of your bill to our club. Is and then we're, no. no, I think it's non-alcoholic <laughs> beverages. <laughs> so you might have to get a virgin. <laughs> but. Um, Anyhow, so that's what we're doing. So if you want to order shirts, we're going to take orders. We have a limited supply of them left today, so if you want to come and get them now, that would be great. We're also going to, also going to be collecting money for pre-ordering, and we'll get more shirts in the first week of May, and we'll come back to the class and deliver them. So, go ahead. Yeah. To on the not today. I, do we have buses? Not, not that I know of. But These are such can, do, such can do people. I'm sure that they're going to look into. We'll probably arrange the carpools with people that are going, but there's no specific buses set up yet. So. That's until this Friday. Yeah. And then if you guys had any questions for our club, you can email us at ssuhumanrightsclub at yahoo.com. Our next meeting is May 2nd. Right? Charlie Brown's Cafe at 7 p.m. So if you're interested in coming in, we do other stuff too with our club, but this is our main focus right now for these two weeks. Not May 3rd? May 3rd, the first Wednesday of every month. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. That's it. Right. Thank you guys. Thanks. T shirts over there. <laughs> if you don't have a chance to uh, make some magic, if you need some help, we will be passing that around every week until the end of the semester. Would you ask the members of the Human Rights Club to stand up? Would the members of the Human Rights Club stand up? <laughs> Would the people in my section please come over here to this side of the stage?